Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Fiction. My name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programming here. How many of you are joining us for the first time this evening? Oh, wow, a bunch of you. Well, you're all very welcome. Um, we're the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction, and we're thrilled to host uh, the amazing fiction writer Tim O'Brien here tonight. Um, if you uh, are a local, please sign up for our mailing list so you don't miss anything else that's coming up. Just a couple of housekeeping announcements. Our cafe and bar will serve until 8.30, and drinks are welcome and encouraged. Um, we will also, we will have a Q&A today, and if you're here, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. That's so that the people who are watching on the live stream can hear you as well. And if you're watching on YouTube, you may add your question to the chat at any time. Books are pre-signed and available for purchase at the bookstore counter. We'll also have a personalization line after the event just on the other side of this wall. Uh, tonight's event is part of our On America series, which... Uh, brings together writers, journalists, activists, and change makers to reflect on the critical issues of our times. And fittingly, we are partnering with Harper's Magazine, the oldest general interest monthly in America, which explores the issues that drive our national conversation through long form narrative journalism and essays and such celebrated features as the iconic Harper's Index. Um, and now for our That's wonderful cool. guest. Uh, John Rick MacArthur is president and publisher of Harper's Magazine and an award-winning journalist and author. Under his leadership, Harper's has received 22 National Magazine Awards, the industry's highest recognition. He edited and wrote the introduction and conducted the last interview for Graham Greene, the last interview and other conversations. And his essays appear regularly in Spectator, and he writes column, a column in French for Montreal's Le Devoir newspaper. In 2017, he was named a Chevalier in the Order of the Arts and Letters, an honor bestowed by the French government. His books include Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the Gulf War, and The Selling of Free Trade, NAFTA, Washington, and the Subversion of American Democracy. And Tim O'Brien received the National Book Award in Fiction for going over, going after Cacciato. The Things They Carried was a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Critics Circle Award. It received the Chicago Tribune Heartland Award in Fiction and France's uh, Prix de Milliers Livre and Tang Tangra. In, 2005, in 2005, The Things They Carried appeared in the New York Times poll of the best work of American fiction in the last 25 years, and it was earlier included among its books of the century. And in 2021, it was named one of the Center for Fiction, Woo! 200 books that shaped 200 years of literature. In the Lake of the Woods, published in 1994, he was, it was chosen by Time Magazine as the best novel of that year. The book also received the James Fenimore Cooper Prize from the Society of American Historians and was selected as one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times. He received the Catherine M. Porter Award presented by the American Academy of Arts and Letters for a distinguished body of work. He's also received the Mark Twain Award in Literature and a Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Dayton Peace Prize Foundation and the Pritzker Military Library. He's been elected to both the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the Ameri American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please welcome them both to the stage. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah. Welcome, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I have interviewed uh, and known a fair number of uh, famous writers and published some. And this is the first time I've wanted to say that I'm honored to be talking with a particular writer. I can't explain exactly why. <laughs> Maybe we'll get to it. And I'm wearing a suit for the first time in three years, in your honor. <laughs> Seriously. So I didn't write the PR for your, for your book, for your new novel, For America Fantastica, but uh, it says it's your first novel in 20 years. So I have to ask you, are you still smoking? Yes. OK. So this, far, the interview was successful. <laughs> 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 uh, 
If they're all yes, no questions, we're out of here. <laughs> this, I, 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 I don't like to over-prepare for an interview, but I did listen to his interview with Terry Gross from a couple years ago, and she was really on your case about it. I'll say. And, and, you, sa and, and, and you, said, you said quite uh, honestly, I think, that you, 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 were, you feared that if you, didn't, if you stopped smoking, you wouldn't be able to write anymore. So uh, does this prove anything? Well, I kept smoking and I wrote a book, so I wouldn't say it's a causal relationship exactly. I don't recommend it, but um, uh, I'm, I'm addicted. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will say that I, I learned to smoke in the Army. Well, in our, they gave us cigarettes in our sea rations like their food, a little pack with four cigarettes in it. And then they'd fly in big nets full of cartons of cigarettes, big boxes just stuffed with cartons. It was a kind of collusion with the government, the yeah. army, and it addicted a whole generation of people. When you're 18 years old and you think you're gonna die with every step, I mean, what's a cigarette? It's nothing, so you do it, and it's lasted ever since. It's, uh, it's both a comfort, and I want one right now, <laughs> uh, of course, it's a danger. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, Tim O'Brien's a great writer, and I really liked America Fantastica, and I urge you to buy it and read it after after we're finished. And I laughed out loud at the last few lines. So you have to finish the novel to know why. <laughs> and how do I know he's a great writer? Well. Uh, I hate to talk, it, it makes me cringe to talk about the writer's craft, but there is a craft here that I, I don't know if you, you, you learned instinctively or what, but the protagonist in this novel, and my job here is not to give away the plot, you're, you're, you're gonna be my guide, uh, Boyd Halverson, uh, he's a reluctant protagonist, I think we could, we could say, is constantly challenged and even outdone by a kind of sub-protagonist named Angie, uh, who is what we used to call a motor mouth, <laughs> and who somehow never repeats herself quite, because Tim never lets her repeat herself. And I, I want to ask you if you're, you were conscious of, of, of preventing her from repeating herself or becoming boring. Because, you know, on the contrary, she's, she's a drive, she may be the driving force in the novel. I don't know. Yeah, I was conscious yeah. of it. Uh, the trick was, was story. That's what, a, what I love and why I do what I do. And out of her mouth comes stories. She talks constantly. She's nonstop uh, until Boyd at one point has to gag her just to keep her quiet. <laughs> and she, even through the gag, she's talking. Uh, but she tells stories that fascinate me. Uh, the story about her mother throwing a stapler at her in a trailer house when she took the Lord's name in vain. A story about how when she was a senior in high school, she was a gymnast and went to the state tournament up in Redding, California, her home state. And she did great until she got to the horse and she screwed it up and uh, went to the sidelines, waited for the final contestant who came up. She's telling this story to Boyd, uh, the, the, the guy she's with. And uh, the, the, the final contestant just masters the horse, you know, the mount, dismount, and everything in between. Just incredible. Wins the trophy. In the locker room, and she sees the trophy sitting on a bench while the winner is in the shower. And she takes the trophy and puts it in her gym bag and leaves and gets on the bus to go home. Uh, four years go by, she goes to business school at Chico State, gets a business administration degree, uh, majoring in, uh, concentrating on banking, and goes a year after that for her first interview at a bank up in Northern California in a fictitious town I invented. And she walks into the bank and, and she says to Boyd, guess who's standing there? And Boyd says, Miss Horse. And she says, no, that's way too coincidental. You were standing there. That's how we first met. <laughs> and he says, you told me this whole story? <laughs> Gymnastics has nothing to do with it. We met at a bank. 
So it's the invention of story that, that matters to me. And uh, I fell in love with her. I, wrote, I, I began this book 21 years ago, long. I dropped it after 30 pages or so. Uh, because I had two kids, and I wanted to be a good father, and you can't be a good father if you're planted in front of a computer all the time. And even if you're not in front of a computer, the characters are in your head at the dinner table, you're frustrated, things wouldn't be. So I, I stopped writing. But Yanji and Boyd stayed with me. They both talked to me, that, that, or so it seemed, just yapping away for 20 years. Things like, I'm cute, I'm smart, um, I'm Pentecostal, I'm a missionary, I can save your soul, I can save America's soul. Write the fucking sentences. And she talked to me, or so it seemed. And so when my kids got old enough, one's now a senior in high school, the other is a junior in college, I finally you know, began to give her her reign. It's never happened to me before where I was captivated by a character. It's always been by plot or theme or something that's coming out of me. This guy, Vietnam, what I remember, the memories, the horrors and the joys, uh, the piety, uh, the, the raw terror. But this came out of another personage. Um, with both characters, with Boyd Halverson being a, a compulsive liar living in an age of liars. Um, he's the best of the best. He beats POTUS, he beats the, everybody, the conspiracy theorists. He's better than they all are. He lies about everything, his age, his height, his weight, his net worth, where he went to college, where he uh, played, I played polo. I mean, just outrageous <laughs> stuff, his mother, his father. He, he's, uh, to me, he's, I became him and I became Angie, but they inhabited me, they became me. In a way, it's never happened before. What's the result? The result was it was fun to write. That was the result for the first time and since my first book, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, so I had a lot of fun reading it, thank right. God. <laughs> and, and, and I presume you've known a few Angies in your life. No? I've certainly known motor mouths, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Usually I have a technique for dispensing with them, which is to turn my back and say, I've got to get a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Not like Boyd, who sometimes just fires a gun, right. puts a stop to the, halts the conversation abruptly. Yes. But, but um, uh you know, I, I, I just, he's not going to, I didn't ask you if you wanted to read from the novel, but I, I have to read one section, sure. just one thing, because <laughs> Angie gets, Angie's in love with Boyd, and, but she's not getting very far with him. I think I can sure. give that away. And, but she gets romantically involved, quote unquote, with some other people along the way. And uh, at one point, um, uh, Boyd, <laughs> Boyd realizes she's being scammed by one of her uh, presumed boyfriends, mm -hmm. uh, Alvin. And uh, so Boyd, there's, they're, they're together, and, and this is how it goes. As a test, Boyd lifted his fork and said, could you repeat that? <laughs> and if you've heard the conversation up to this point, you would laugh out loud. Repeat what, Angie, Angie asked? Everything, all of it. Angie squinted at him. What does everything mean? The whole spiel, said Boyd, what you've been talking about for the last 20 years or so. I think Alvin might have dozed off. For a moment, Angie's eyes shifted toward Alvin, then slid back toward, toward Boyd. He has this smiling trick, Boyd explained. It makes him look sort of interested, like he's enjoying it. Alvin mumbled something, chuckled, and walked away. Well, Angie said, that was probably the rudest thing I've ever heard just when Alvin's starting to find his way. So anyway, I like that. So anyway, so um, uh, I mean, they go, you know, they spend hundreds of hours together driving cross country on the lamb in theory, uh, and uh, because he's robbed a bank where she worked. And uh, Angie never quite wears Boyd out. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, do you think Boyd is tolerant, passive, 
or is he maybe half in love with her? I don't know what the what the. Uh, I don't know either, I, I, uh, and I like to keep things that way. That okay. I need a mystery. Yeah. Inside a character, the same way if I meet somebody, if there's not something mysterious or unknown about the person, or tantalizing or something I'm curious about, I lose interest. And so I I try to leave my characters with ambiguity. There's a line in a poem by Robert Graves, nice contradiction between fact and fact makes the whole read human and exact. And I believe in that, that there's a contradictory quality. Is he in love with her? Does he like her? I view the two of them as having a moral tug of war throughout the book. Okay. She's tugging him toward lose the lying, accept Christ, you'll go to heaven, <laughs> literally, through the pearly gates, and there'll be a welcome wagon waiting for you, and casinos and places to have fun. And he's pushing back against this. Um, and th th that, th that kind of moral combat between them is, for me, fun and funny. That, that uh, th th their personalities are in some ways so alike, in other ways so different, that there's a friction between them that kept me going for the entire book. Okay. So back to technique, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, I'm going to quote from The Things They Carried, which of course is Tim's most famous book. And uh, along the way you say, the thing about a story is that you dream it as you tell it, hoping that others might then dream along with you. And in this way, memory and imagination and language combine to make spirits in the head. There is the, there is the illusion of aliveness. Is that still how you feel about fiction Absolutely. writing? Yeah. You want to expand? I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay. It's, uh, okay. It's really what I believe. Spirits in the head. It's kind of what I met when I was talking earlier at the dinner table. My kids and wife trying to talk about football or baseball or something. And these spirits in my, are going around in my head talking to me. They're as real to me as you are when you're not present, or the way my father, who's dead, who's not present, is real to me when I you know, think about him or, or dream about him. It, there is some, there's something abiding. And fictional characters are that way for me. Uh, Merceau in L'Etranger, he's alive for me as a human being, a guy who's executed for apathy. I mean, it's really bizarre, but, but I can sympathize with it. Yeah. Um, in so many ways, I'm apathetic, or the way Ahab is alive for me, or Huck Finn, or so many characters in fiction. There, there are spirits in the head um, that were so well imagined by the authors that they felt alive as I read them, and they feel alive having closed the book. As we close the book on my dad's life, he's still alive. And for me, fictional characters, if they're well done, uh, if they entertain not just through laughter or through tears, but somehow entertain your spirit, your conscience, your, there's something that reverberates with, uh, with, with fictional characters that approximates immortality. It's not quite that, but it approximates it. Okay. Um, uh... Let's talk about the lying epidemic, mythomania. There's a, a Trump overlay in the novel, and, uh, but it's more sophisticated than, than that because uh, it's all coming from this uh, uh, mythical sort of place called Fulda, California. Although I just wondered off the top of my head whether you have any association with the Fulda Gap in Germany? Well, I know about it. You know about but it. That's not the, there's a little town of about yeah. 100 people at, near my hometown. I just stole the name and transplanted it to, to California. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. But I do know about the Fulda Gap, yeah. I thought it might be some, you know, very obscure Cold no, War just, reference I, or something. I just needed a very short name. Fulda, Fulda, Fulda Gap was where the, the You're American typing a Army. novel and you got to yeah. type some long name every <laughs> right, time you name it. Save your... That's how I got carpal tunnel. I gave characters names that were too long. 
So no, I just cho I chose it because it was a familiar okay. town to me. Okay. Fulda Gap was where the American army was positioned to prevent an invasion by the Warsaw Pact in Germany during the Cold War. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> for what it's worth, uh, uh, but in any event, the 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 there in Fulda, there's all sorts of really extravagant lying going on. But there's this little club. I don't know what you'd call it, it's sort of a breakfast club <laughs> of, of specialist liars mm -hmm. who make up all sorts of great stories and they, they sort of workshop stuff for each other. They, they, work, they work out uh, lies out loud and say, you think that one will fly and mm -hmm. whatever. And, and so uh, I did think again, uh, I, today I guess we could call them influencers, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're very, very, sophisticated influencers and they, they, they get together throughout the novel to, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, work out uh, language. And I'm just gonna read one of them to you because again, I think it's a kind of a tour de force, if you don't mind my saying so. It's page 420 here, sorry. Um, Mythomania, well, this is not them talking, but this is a kind of summary of Tim's. Mythomania was, a, was the new rabies. It dissolved brain cells, infected, infected blackbirds, skunks, and congressmen from Ohio. A lobster fisherman named Jib Walker, working, working out of Rockport, Maine, tweeted out the news that a liberal cabal had been caught reprogramming Minutemen missiles to strike targets in Austin, Texas, Tallahassee, Florida, Florida, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The war between the states, Jib proclaimed, would soon go nuclear. Confederate uniforms had been issued. The governor of Texas had ordered women to speed up the gestation process to provide fresh new troops. <laughs> while, meanwhile, um, while meanwhile, walls and other entrenchments went up around the states of Tennessee, Alabama, Idaho, Florida, and South Carolina. Kentucky was digging a moat. In Washington, D.C., the United States Supreme Court ruled five to four in favor of a, a petition to suspend habeas cor corpus in the case of a young woman accused of violating the required child delivery clause of Missouri's amended state constitution. And in Baskin, Minnesota, just north of the Iowa state line, the town council imposed stringent new proof of citizenship requirements, including duplicate videos of conception. <laughs> so, I guess I guess something got to you well, at some point. Yeah. But, uh, so, something something it, sort it of annoying. Something that, was annoying you. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, you watch Fox News long enough yeah. and, and listen to all this conspiracy shit coming out of the chat room yeah. all across America. Uh, it's time to have fun with it. People believe this stuff, you know. I read online that. There's a line in the book that I just copped from the real world that reptiles man the phone banks at the IRS. Like, <laughs> literally, it was meant like salamanders are saying, how you doing? <laughs> the problem with the IRS is that they never answer their phones, so the reptiles never have to talk. Try calling them up someday. Yeah, it came out of the real world. It was, having, it was fun to kind of try to out-preposterize the preposterous stuff that's around us all the time now. Maybe it goes back to Babylon. I don't know if it's brand new or not and don't much care. I don't mean to be historical about the, the oddity or even the uniqueness of our present times, but uh, deception's all around us. Try calling AT&T and you're gonna get a recording that's saying, sorry, this is a phone company recording. <laughs> Sorry, but our lines are unusually busy. <laughs> Enjoy the flute music. Yeah. And you wait for 40 minutes. They're, they're all, lines are always busy. <laughs> it's not unusual, it's usual. It's a, it's a lie, a recorded lie. Because it's not tr ever true. So you deal with that long enough as a citizen of this country. That's the sort of thing that makes me sort of yap at the telephone while I'm listening to the flute music. Yeah, you're unusually busy, my app. And I sort of talk to that thing, hoping, remember that thing, this line's being recorded, hoping they're recording me to hear my, my vitriol as I get lied to. 
The same thing happens with my TV set, you know, CNN. When I listen to the news, I'm yapping back at politicians as much as they're sort of talking to me with some of the preposterous stuff. But mostly it has to do with the, uh, the conspiracy stuff. That I live in Texas, and it's alive and well there. It's on talk radio late at night almost all the time. And the, the most ludicrous stuff. So to have fun with it was fun. It, you cannot, rationality is irrelevant. You can't reason these people out of what they believe. So as, as we see with the government shut, you've got this Congress totally divided. No one, there's a line from Socrates I memorized back in high school. The object of our discussion is not that your words should triumph over mine, nor that mine should triumph over yours, but that between us we might discover the most perfect truth. That doesn't happen now. There's no, dis through rational discussion and argumentation to arrive at some accommodation, it's gone now. So why not laugh at the fuckers? If, you, if, they, if they don't want to listen to reason and be reasonable, let's, why not laugh at them? I don't like being laughed at, and I'm hoping they don't, and uh, and hoping you laugh at this book, because it is funny, at least to me, in my perverted idea of what's funny. Yeah, the, the, the problem is you wind up with the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the Statue of Liberty was back where it belonged, crated up in the dark cellar of the Louvre. Yeah. <laughs> I like that line too. So, yeah. In fact, Ellis Island, I write, is the Chernobyl of America. Yeah. About, you know the whole anti-immigrant stuff going on. It's reminiscent of the 19. I'm looking at Jan, a historian friend of mine. It's re it's reminiscent of the 1920s. You know that that period of anti-immigration, and earlier than that, and in the 1880s, um, and we're going through another phase of it right now. Yeah, I don't want to turn serious now, but but uh, I also you also could could infer from the narrative that self delusion is a bigger problem than actual outright outright out loud lying, public lying, and everybody in this novel indulge every character indulges in some considerable measure of self self delusion, from uh, Randy the grifter killer who's um, uh, Angie's original boyfriend to Doug, who's a great character, a small town banker whose bank has been robbed, um, all the way to the criminal billionaire, uh, 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 Jim Dooney. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but if we're talking about the human, because one of the things I do like about the book is that you are talking about the human condition. You're not just doing it for laughs. Mm -hmm. And um, um, do you think self-delusion is just uh, uh, baked in and there's nothing we can do about it? Because there is a, a great moment in the novel, I think, when uh, Boyd's uh, ex-wife uh, confronts him and says, you know, what's with this constant lying? Mm -hmm. You think it's going to hurt you to tell the truth? Mm -hmm. And he says, I don't know, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. debatable. So what's the well self delusion yeah. is a good point yeah. that uh, I think we need I think there's a dangerous side to it but there's a necessary side to it we need our fan our fantasies that tomorrow will be better than today uh, people go to buy lottery tickets with that hope that I'll come out of poverty and hit the jackpot casinos across America are filled with people like me. <laughs> hoping to win. Um, the, the fantasy, the Prince Charming fantasy that, you know, teenage girls may have and the opposite for men. Uh, without fantasy, I'm not sure we could, we would be wholly human. I don't think squirrels fantasize. I think they, unless it's about acorns and that's it. <laughs> Where's the next one? In the same way we do, that fantasy has tomorrowness built into it. It's not todayness. There's a fantasy that something will happen that I yearn for. Uh, that's the that's the good side, and it may be a form of self-delusion that there's a heaven and a hell, that the pearly gates are real. 
uh, that there's life after death, the fantasy that you will live on with the books we write or the children we raise, that somehow we'll find immortality. I think we have to have it. The dangerous part of it is when it starts hurting other people. When you start betraying yourself through self-delusion, or you start hurting your loved ones, or you start hurting constitutional democracy through your lies, then you're hurting other people. That's the dangerous side of what's necessary. Uh, so is there something, anything we can do about it? I don't think so, because we're human. That I think we, that built into the human spirit is consciousness of our own mortality. We know we're going to die, and therefore we find things to fantasize about during the world. You know, playing, going to cocktail parties, to talking about books, anything we do is to avoid the obvious that's waiting for us down the line, which is oblivion. We find ways to to uh, avoid it. Uh, and I think we have to because we're human. So I don't think there is a way to erase it from the human spirit. I wish there were a way to erase the dangerous side of it, though. And the only way I can think of to do it, that is the dangerous side being when it hurts other people, is, is to do what Mark Twain did and what Jonathan Swift did. In, uh, I'm sure most of you read A Modest Proposal by Swift. Uh, the cure for famine is to eat our children. And Lots of protein, it's, it's fresh, um, it's not, not, not packaged like Oscar Mayer, lots of vitamins, <laughs> and, and he, he's, re, he's reacting to pr ludicrous proposals to you know, solve the problem of famine in Ireland with a really funny piece, pushing the preposterous to an extreme that makes you laugh out loud. I think it's a way of striking back at things uh, that I've never thought of myself and I'm not a funny person. I'm kind of a, more of an earnest go to work and write books kind of guy. But I do find myself when I'm, when I'm, um, when things are really bad, I'll sometimes chuckle at the badness, which I did on a train coming here um, this morning. That bad thing happened to me, and I found myself chuckling at it. There's life, you know. Bad stuff happens. <laughs> okay, a lot I'm of bad. Chuckling stuff. now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it wasn't life or death, not cancer. Don't worry. <laughs> but close. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know if this is. There's a thread to what I'm doing here, but I have to ask you. He, you don't go in much for explicit sex in your no. just in your novels but you do have some more great more you do life. have you, right right <laughs> but to some extent this is a relief to me and and but there is one line where you, Doug the the banker he's 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 a he's a real case uh, and he gets involved with what's her name Wanda Jane? Wanda Jane. Wanda Jane, who's a kind of a, some kind of a fitness instructor. No. Oh, that's Hedda. Hedda Toadhauser. I'm sorry, Hedda. Hedda. Hedda Toad. I know. He Toad means. And Wanda Jane is his, his wife. German his wife. Hedda comes later. House sorry. means yeah. house. Yeah. So her name is Hedda yeah. Death House. And uh, she's a CrossFit instructor who. Uh, <laughs> who is CrossFit, Death's, right. Yeah. Okay. None of this is making sense to the audience. But <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> But, but the, one of the things yeah. with, about doing what I'm doing is you end up paraphrasing your a novel is a novel. It's like a yeah, story that right. grows and everything sort of more or less connects. In fact, more than more or less, right. it all connects. But doing what we're doing, we have to sort of pluck things out right. and then throw them at an audience who has no idea what the hell we're talking about, hoping that something will sort of you know, grab you and make you say, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Grabbed you is the appropriate word because so the, back the to line head, back to head of Toadhauser. <laughs> right. The sorry. Go ahead. Finish. No, you. No, but the, the line I was going to quote is, "Doug gripped a breast and gathered his thoughts." <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm at, this is a rhetorical question. Is this a first in American literature? I don't. I've never heard the uh, expression. It's amazing, amazing what you do yeah. after a couple of cigarettes <laughs> and a glass of wine. <laughs> 
That's how I gather my thoughts. <laughs> I don't know how you guys do it. So they ask you, what writers do you admire? I mean, who are your favorite writers? I mentioned a couple earlier. Yeah. I talked about Camus. That yeah. I get to, okay. I've loved it since I was in high school, and I continue to love it. My two kids, who are not big readers, yeah. love it. Um, there's, 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 uh, there's meanness and there's humanness inside that, that closed mouth, almost silent character that uh, feels the me of 2 a.m. or 3 in the morning when I can't sleep. Or you're silent, but the world is in your head. And that image early on in the book of his dead mother, and he can't find grief, and he can't cry, uh, and doesn't even want to. He kind of wants out at uh, that uh, wake. It, there's a meanness inside of that where language is, uh, what, what, what do you do to express sorrow? And really, what do you do to express great love through language? I love you. That helps the language a little, but it seems insufficient. So that, that writer, I, that book, I really admired. There are so many. The short stories of Ernest Hemingway, the really good ones, like Up in Michigan, Indian Camp, I think are just so well, well made. They seem visceral and alive to me. I love Tender is the Night, a lot of the moderns I really like. I also like a lot of poetry and uh, read a lot of it. I have many friends who are poets, and they send me their books, and I diligently read them. Most of them I don't like, but the same is true of fiction. <laughs> Most of it I don't, it does. It's not that it's bad, it's just that not to my taste. Um, so to single anything out, the problem with that for me is I always forget, why didn't I mention Lolita? Why did I mention, why did I forget Pale Fire, one of the best novels ever written, poem novel? It's just an incredible work of art. Um, thank God I'm pausing now to remember some of these things, but I'll go back to my hotel room and I'll say, God, Rick asked me this question and I, <laughs> you know, I forgot my hero, <laughs> and I probably did. Well, I was going to, just off the top of my head, I was going to say you make me think of Thomas McGuane. Wonderful. I don't know writer. if you care, you know, if you care for him or not, but I do. I'm not I, comparing you to him. I just it's an association I have. Oh, he's his a wonderful writer. I remember yeah. physically where I was. I was in a in Boston in a parking lot, having just come out of a grocery store, and as I came out of the grocery store, to my left was a bookstore, and I saw 92 in the shade in the in the window of it. Later bought it and just. If you've read uh, a couple of pages of McGuane, his voice as a writer will always be with you. Um, he had a distinctive sound to his prose. So did a writer named Robert Stone. Yeah. If you read Stone, yeah. you know you're in the hands of Robert Stone. Same with Conrad. You read any Conrad, you know within a couple of paragraphs for sure, but usually within a couple of sentences, you're in the hands of, of Joseph Conrad. And that's, that, that, that's one of the great achievements of really, really superb writers, is the, so, the sound of the prose. You cannot talk about it on, in situations like this. That is to say, you can't explain it, you can't describe why it's that way. It just, there's an isness to it. It just is that voice. And, uh, that, that's the kind of work I really, really admire. Pale Fire has that as well. It's a cranky Russian emigre kind of voice, an incredibly smart tone of voice, but a powerful voice. So if you can imagine an accommodation who is really, really powerful in spirit, that's the voice coming out of you out of that novel. Okay. Uh, what about journalism? Boyd Halverson is a uh, the protagonist is a lapsed and very cynical former newspaper reporter who, I guess, did some serious journalism, did some investigative reporting. Uh, paradoxically, since he's, <laughs> he's more interested in making things up than in finding the truth, for right. the most part. Uh, did you ever want to be a, a reporter or, or a journalist? Did that ever 
attract you in any way? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was yeah. a reporter for the Washington Post for about two years, that's I guess. Right, you were, that's like right, that. right, right, right. But I, I couldn't lie. And you, that was the, <laughs> I always thought, I mean, if you have, if, that was, this was back during Watergate. I always thought, God, I could lie better than Nixon. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. it sounded so stiff and unbelievable. It didn't sound credible. But you couldn't make anything up. And I, that, I, I always wanted to, uh, and you can't do it. So I did it for two years, and then uh, I was working on Cacciato at the time, so I could go home and live in the world of imagination, and then back to the world of straight journalism. But uh, I, pr I preferred the world of imagination in my head. What did you cover? When you were, we just I was general, general assignment. assignment. I covered yeah. all kinds of stuff: yeah. Senate hearings, uh, the eighteen-year-old vote. Um, I did went to a gay dance up in Maine to cover that back when that was, you know, sort of weird and brand new. Uh, went to Rifle, Colorado, and covered the incidents of deaths by cancer in a little small town in the mountains. Uh, west of Denver. Um, I went on the campaign tour with Sergeant Shriver when he was running for vice president with McGovern. Um, I was always out of my depth. That I, I, I lived in terror of not getting things right. I had never, I'd never written, they hired me as an intern at first and then as I went on full time when another reporter went on leave. But it was a, it was a life of terror, and I must you can't make errors of fact in a novel because everything's made up, so you don't have that sort of terror or stress on you. It's stressful enough writing sentences, period, trying to make a fresh and somewhat original sentence. So I I, I much prefer what I do now. Okay, I'm I'm running out of time, but I'm embarrassed to ask a Vietnam question because I promised myself <laughs> originally I wouldn't ask anything about Vietnam. But these are a little bit off because I want to know whether you really did work in an armor meatpacking plant in Worthington. So I you, did. What you describe and the things they carry really happened. I did. I had yeah. that job. It lasted. Yeah. I didn't. I, <clears throat> It was a summer that I got drafted, yeah. and in my yeah. hometown there was what was then right. Armour. It's now another company owns it. Swift had it for a while, and I was given that my job title was declotter, That's and I yeah. stood with this uh, yeah. kind of like a gun. It was that that long, and it was suspended from the ceiling by an elastic kind of a rubber hose, and had bounce to it. And at one end was a was a roller brush, and at this end was a little trigger, and the pigs in another part of the plant were killed, uh, decapitated, hung up by their, slid open, and hung up by their hind hocks. And they come on this assembly line, and in the neck cavity, which is down here, the job, I put this thing in and pulled the thing in this roller brush, and then the, the world would just explode. There were, there were like softball-sized clots of blood, I mean, big, big clots, maybe three of them. And they just boom like this, and you just be covered. So you have goggles and like, but you go home smelling like like a sausage or a pork <laughs> chop. And you just, it's, it was. I lasted I don't know eight days, something like that, and I, I gave it up out of disgust, and uh, haven't worked a day since. So then, <laughs> so then, did you go out smelling like pork sausage and? Or uh, and really ring doorbells for Gene McCarthy. I did that too yeah, because this yeah. is to I did. me tremendously significant because it gives you real credibility when you say, which I know a fair number of Vietnam veterans, and I have never heard any of them say that that they felt they were cowardly uh, for not dodging the draft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know. It's uh, including the ones who dodge. I actually know some who <laughs> know a lot of draft dodgers too. But but I'm talking about actual Vietnam veterans. So yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I did the wrong thing. Yeah. yeah. So should have said no and didn't. Yeah. You're right. I mean, I forgive myself in some yeah. ways. Other times I don't. That sometimes late at night I I don't forgive myself. Other times I I say, well, you're 18 or what was I? 20 actually. 
and 21. And, uh, you know, a small town kid and didn't want to embarrass my parents by going to Canada. It was like, it was like a 200 mile drive out of yeah. Minnesota. You could be there in, you know, a few hours. And I thought about it and fantasized about it, uh, but never did it. But I didn't want my parents to be sitting in some cafe in this small town and hearing some farmer say to the other, did you hear what the O'Brien kid did? Yeah. Sissy went to Canada and my mom and dad, uh, their eyes would meet. And Which one was pro-war and which one was anti-war? Mother, father? Uh, just the opposite of what you think. My mom was for the war, and my dad was against, against it. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm not that. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Actually, I'm almost. I'm out of time, but got to ask two more quick questions. Uh, it's just this is a quibble, not a <laughs> criticism of your your book, but the lying. I, don't like quibbles I mean, either. the the, 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 the <laughs> lying epidemic for me started yeah. in 1964. I mean, the big big lying mm -hmm. epidemic started in 64 with the Tonkin, Tonkin Gulf. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I try to say that in the first so, first yeah. sentence of the book. Wait, okay. I think that's as old Did as I Babylon or something yeah. like that. Okay, okay. I think I even said it here. Yeah. That it's not yeah. new. Uh, and I don't and I don't mean to say that this country is any different, yeah. probably from any other country. Right. But it is my country, and I treat my country like I do my children. I love my children, and I discipline them. I tell them I don't like what they do something. And I feel that way about my country. I think we all should, that I can love it, but I'm not going to love everything it does. And that's too much to expect. Okay. And the last question is, did you read, did you read the Red Badge of Courage in high oh, school? yeah. In high I school? And so what did you think of it after you'd been to Vietnam? Because some people say, well, it's uh, astonishing that Stephen Crane is able to describe combat without ever having been near a battlefield or anything until until after. It, it was much at later. first, but it became yeah. less astonishing yeah. the older I got and the more I wrote. That uh, I, I've written so much now about things I've never personally witnessed or yeah. experienced, including Angie. I've never been a woman right. yet. <laughs> and yet I felt I was inside her. I wanted what she wanted for the world. I loved her energy, and I was her. So I've learned not, you don't have to necessarily be a, a woman, for example, to write from the woman's point of view, or a man, you know, if you don't have to be a man necessarily to write from a man's point of view. God knows Flaubert did pretty well with Madame Bovary, and, Shakespeare did pretty well with, you know, Lady Macbeth and, you know, Rosalind. So I don't think it's necessary to experience it. I think the imagination can gather around the horror of it all, the fear of it all. When Henry Fleming in The Red Badge of Courage runs from battle the first time, the book is sort of structured around gaining courage. First he flees from battle, then he manages to go into this massacring, horrid thing called the American Civil War, which was just slaughter. I mean, it was really horrid, much worse than Vietnam. I, and uh, finally gathers the courage to confront death. I, I never felt Henry Fleming-ish. I didn't want to, I wanted to just plain flee and yet somehow my legs kept moving. I almost and look it down at them and my, God, your feet are still going down this rice paddy and, and every corpuscle in my body would just drop. What can they do? I mean, they can't send you to Vietnam because you're already there. You can go to jail, sounds preferable to what I was doing. Um, there's not a lot they can do. They can send you to Japan as a metal case, that sounds cozy and good and I, I like sushi so <laughs> but my body just kept doing it um, almost without any loss of willpower I don't know what pushed me through the war it certainly wasn't courage it was something else fear of embarrassment I think mostly to drop out or look like a coward in front of my friends you know the guys that I got to know so well uh, some other force was pressing me through the war. 
as I think for all of us it does through life itself, that there's some force that presses us through. We go through tragedies, we go through lost loves and dead parents, and and we keep pushing, pushing forward. And we're pushing forward toward what we know intellectually is oblivion, but we keep pressing forward anyway, knowing what's at the end of the trail. And there's something wonderful about the human spirit that can do that. It just amazes me. And it's more or less what I try to write about, whether from comically or tragic. Okay, thanks. Questions? Yeah. I was not trying to set up, right, yeah. 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 I was not, I was not trying to go with the audience into an argument about cultural appropriation <laughs> or identity <laughs> politics. I really wanted to know. Okay, right here, yeah. Um, oh, I, I've been teaching the things they carry for over 20 years, and I just got back from a conference where there were a plethora of English teachers that, that teach it as well. Did you ever imagine that the book would be taken into current curriculums the way it is? Imagine that the book would be... Taken into current curriculums in high schools throughout the country. No. <laughs> um. I wrote, I wrote the book without any, I, I was working on another book in the Lake of the, which became in the Lake of the Woods. It got stuck. Um, and I, went, I had a lunch with my publisher, Sam Lawrence. And he uh, just thought, he said, what are you working on? And I started to say, I'm stuck on, but I stopped and said, I made up, a, I'm gonna write a book about using my own name and it's gonna be about Vietnam but it's gonna be fiction, and I'm gonna make people think it's a memoir, and it's gonna read like a memoir, so that people are asking, is it true, is it false, what is truth, what is false? I kind of winged this thing, and then, <laughs> then did it. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't written with expectation. It was written with the, uh, the, the, the words that I expressed to that publisher that day at that at that luncheon table, um, to write a book that was fiction that didn't read like fiction, is the best I could say it, is it, I wanted it to feel as if, is, and God knows I get plenty of people saying, you know, that they believed it all and they were pissed off that it, when they found out it was fiction. But that felt like a triumph to me when I hear that, because that's what the, the goal was. So. Beyond that, I had real no, no, that, it was an interstitial book between one book and another. And uh, written much like this book for fun. It was written with the intention of fun. And I carried this off as, uh, and that, so no, I didn't have that expectation. Right here. You said you stopped writing fiction when your kids were young. Yes. What did you do all day while they were at school? Um, <laughs> what did I do? I just, I can't. So, sorry. Go ahead. Repeat it so I'll, they can hear. You said you stopped writing fiction when your kids were young. What did you do all day while they were at school? I read lots and lots of books, stuff that I thought I should have read years and years ago. And I reread a lot of stuff. Um, I filled myself up with what I wasn't able to fill myself up with when I was writing books, which was read tons. And I filled myself up with things that, that I'm so glad I filled myself up with. I mentioned a couple of them on my little tiny list I gave here, but there were so many more. Um, I golfed. Uh, what else did I do? I can't remember what else I <laughs> You smoked. I smoked. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> I don't remember much beyond that. I remember, I remember I was just reading and reading and reading and reading. So, and I did, as I mentioned earlier, I did start like 20 pages of this book that I finally now finished, but gave that up. Good question. I'm 77 <laughs> now. I just turned it and I can't remember yesterday, but 
<laughs> much less before that. Um, so you mentioned that you started the book, stopped for about 20 years, and then returned to it. What was the process like of returning to a piece of work that you had started so long ago? It was like returning to old friends, because I'd, as I mentioned, they'd been talking in my head for all these years. So it was re returning with a sense I would get to spend time with them now. It's like I haven't seen my friend Aaron now in you know a couple of years or so, and it's different when you're with somebody. You're not imagining their lives anymore, and we're not just talking on the phone. We're with each other, and that's how it felt with the characters. Now I'm with them, um, and I watched them growing throughout the book. That they they they're, they're changing throughout the book, and that's <clears throat> like when you're raising a kid, you. You take pleasure in watching the growth happen of the character. They don't always grow in happy ways. They can sometimes grow in dismal ways, but they do grow and evolve and mutate the way people do. I'm not the person I was three days ago, and uh, three days ago I wasn't the person I was a year before that. We all evolve by our the disappointments, the joys, the things that happen in our lives. And that's how it felt with the characters. I was meeting old friends for an extended period of time. That was a conversation killer. <laughs> <laughs> Did I see somebody else? There. Right here. Or in what? Well, you decide. I can't decide. It was simultaneous. How big an influence on the whole topic of lying and uh, deluding ourselves was the Vietnam lie? Was that the original influence in your life that way? And did it continue through lying on the other side of the aisle? I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> And would you please, that depends on what your, your uh, meaning of is, is, uh, up until, you know, the world-class lying that we have today. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about Vietnam probably being where, I mean, I'm young, I'm right out of college, and I'm finding out that what was told to me about the war just wasn't the case when you're there, it's just obviously not, we were not winning the war. We were losing the war, and all the. In fact, it turned out the CIA agreed with me. I mean, they were giving secret estimates to Johnson that we're not winning. It was the other intelligence agencies, the military ones in particular, that were feeding the body count stuff and pretending that was a kind of victory when they were largely invented. Um, but it wasn't the only thing. It was sort of the, the, when Rick was mentioning the self-delusion thing, that I've done it, we think we've all done it, where we delude ourselves about what, what kind of people we are. That I had gone to Vietnam thinking I was a nice, polite, Midwestern, normal guy and found out that there was another aspect to me that I was denied, I guess, that I could kill people and not cry about it, which would have shocked me before I got there. I wouldn't have believed it about myself. And um, so I think I was d denying that aspect of myself both before the war and then again when I got home, that there's, there are two or more of me. It's partly why in this book I give every character a couple of names, a couple of... of I, the main character has four names. Boyd is only one of them. And personalities, because I think that in a way we're not just one person. We're a whole bunch of people at different stages of our lives, and sometimes they're combined together. We're mixtures of people. Now it seems just sort of common sense to say that, but now back then it didn't seem commonsensical. So 
lying. I'm interested in the issue of truth. What is true? Well, there aren't bits of truth floating around out there, like the sun doesn't say, hey, I'm the center of the solar system. Or a bug doesn't say, hey, I'm a bug. Or humans declare things like the sun is the center of the solar system. But the sun doesn't do it. It's not truth floating out there. Um, so it's dependent on, and human beings change their minds. People fall out of love. Uh, and the person you were on Tuesday may not be the person you were on Thursday. And what was true to you on Tuesday may not be true to you on Friday. The earth was once flat. Not anymore. I could say it's 9 o'clock here. And I'd be telling the truth, roughly. But it's not true in Tokyo, is it? Or elsewhere. So there's a temporal component to it. What's true to a Christian may not be true to a Muslim or a Hindu. It's human generated. And it's, it's, on top of that, it's mutable. It changes over time what we declare is true. Galileo found that out. We find it out. On the, on the Fox News and on CNN, how mutable truth is. He won the election, he didn't. Um, it, it, so it, it's fascinated me probably because of Vietnam, the trauma of that, but it stayed with me in a kind of cerebral way where I've thought about it a lot and uh, written about it a lot in Things They Carried in the Lake of the Woods in this book. Uh, and in Cacciato. So it's an intellectual interest, but I think that you're right. It was probably, it was probably blossomed in Vietnam. Do you want to squeeze in one more question? Because you guys were, you put your hands up almost simultaneously. This is the last question. This is going to be the easiest question of the night. I, I, I wonder, do you, or in your career, with this book, any of them, have you ever found any value reading reviews of your own work? Any value what? Reading reviews of your own work. Reading reviews? Yeah. Like, have you ever found any value to that? Well, yeah, there's value in it. You know who to murder and who to <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to go kill everybody just because of a baby. Just get the guy who did it. No, I haven't. Not... No. There was a, Murakami had, I just, I don't know, my, my, one of my best friends sent me a uh, thing about Haruki Murakami where he was in Spain recently, won some big award, and he was asked exactly that question, and he said, no, he wasn't asked exactly that, he was asked a similar question, he'd gotten a prize, and he said, I don't, I don't, I don't pay much attention to prizes. And uh, the guy said, the interviewer said, why? And he said, well, because it's someone else's opinion, and I have my own opinions <laughs> of my work. I know when I'm good <laughs> and when I'm bad, <laughs> and when I'm sort of mediocre. And that's kind of the truth. It doesn't mean that you don't like want to murder, because you do. That, uh, but that I, I, I'm. I know how good this book is. It's really fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> and I know what it is. Yeah. And so it's not going to hurt. It's got my seal of approval. It's my book of the year. <laughs> I just want to preempt Thank any you. potential violence <laughs> down, down the road. I, it, it, I already filed it. It's I, for another magazine I write for. It's my book of the year. So you got to buy it. Thank you. OK? Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Before we're done, I just want to—I I, want to say thank you for being here. I wouldn't be here to hear myself. It's—it's <laughs> it's not. It's that I so admire you for coming and enduring this and being interested enough in it that it's—it's it's flabbergasting and wonderful for me. I don't say this after you know. 
other stuff I do. Like if I go to a baseball game, I don't say thank you for coming. <laughs> but really, I really mean it from the heart. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. All right, the books are right over at the bookstore counter. Go get them and then come to the cafe to get them personalized. Thank you. Great. I'll give you back this. Okay. Oh, that came, that's come off a hundred.